Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Too Black. Um, we are doing another uh, myth revisited for our BPM um, viewers and listeners. Um, so today's myth is the myth of trickle down blackness. I will return to that. Um, but we are interviewing um, professor, assistant professor of, at Georgetown. His name is Ofemi Taiwo. He is mostly known to my knowledge. Um, for, for those of us who aren't deep into it, for his his essay, Elite Capture and Identity Politics, that one really blew up on the internet. But he's written he's written vastly and across you know various publications, including The Nation, um, The New Republic, Al Jazeera, Boston Review, which that essay was in. Um, and but identity politics and elite capture was actually one of the top red pieces in the Boston Review. Uh, so we, this episode is a little different than how most of our episodes go. We use the philosophical lens as the primary um, debunking tool, for lack of a better term. Um, so we're not going to hit you with as much on stats in this episode. It's much more um, based on how things are framed. This idea of um, the myth of trickle-down blackness um, comes from this idea of... Um, the Reaganomics or trickle down economics. And this this idea that if you concentrate wealth and capital at the top, the people who make the most money, if you eliminate all the barriers from taxes to regulations and so forth, you don't focus so much on redistributing. You limit big government, create small government. This is all the kind of neoliberal lo logic. By doing that, the success and the money that's concentrated up there will trickle down to the masses of people in the society. Now, this did not work. <laughs> this has created more financial crises, crises than, um, than capitalism already produced. This actually escalated the problem. Um, this, so this was not a successful thing for the masses of people, but capitalism never does that anyway. Um, you know, so this is how you end up with financialization. This is how you end up with the economic crash in 2007. There was there were several that similar, like not as bad, but you know, it was you know, like credit card crash in, in, in the late 80s. There was a dot com crash and so on and so forth. Um, so analogous to that is if you were to take the success of black elites and we by concentrating their success at, at the top, their success is supposed to trickle down materially to the rest of us, right? The, the masses of black people. And I think most of us without even doing the research can just look around and see that has not happened. But the idea is that if you put a black president in office, if you have more black people, if you have more representation in, in movies and television and, and more black stories and black excellence and all of these things get told, then that's gonna materially trickle down to the rest of us. Um, and, and, and my argument is it's not. So this idea was extracted um, from reading Femi's piece uh, or from reading Femi's work in general, but particularly one um, specifically. Um, and I'm going to read from this piece and then we're going to get going into this interview. In this interview, we're going to go over three particular essays that he wrote. The, imp the Empire Has No Clothes, Elite Capture and Identity Politics, Being in the Room Privilege, Elite Capture and Epistemic Deference. Um, so I'm going to read from the last one on epistemic deference. And he says, quote, Elites from marginalized groups can benefit from this arrangement in ways that are compatible with social progress. But treating group elites' interests as necessarily or even presumptively aligned with full groups' interests involves a political naivete we cannot afford. Such treatment of elite interests functions as a racial regonomics, there it is, a strategy reliant on fantasies about the exchange rate between the attention economy and the material economy. Perhaps the lucky few who get jobs find it the most culturally authentic and cosmetically radical description of continuing carnage are really winning one for the culture. 
Then, after we in the chattering classes get the clout we deserve and secure the bag, its contents will eventually trickle down to the workers who clean up after the conference to the slums of the global South's megacities to its countryside, but probably not. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get into this interview. Um, we start with a question pulled from the first essay, The Empire Has No Clothes, and it's a question about what, what is called agenda setting. So let's go. I got the idea that became this paper that actually became um, a couple papers, but The Empire Has No Clothes is the one that came out. Um, but I read Robin Kelly's article, We Are Not What We Seem, back in grad school. Mm -hmm. And at around the same time, I read James Scott's, um, James Scott has some work on um, uh, South Asian folks. And, and both, both Robin Kelly and James Scott are making the same point where, you know, historians and anthropologists and sociologists, all these people um, are talking about the kind of legitimacy that, that the state has, whether it's the United States or, you know, local economies, and they're talking about how everyone kind of gets along in the system. And both of them just made the point that, you know, you can't judge what people believe, you can't judge their belief in the legitimacy of these structures by what they do, because they're what they do is explained by the fact that they're trying to make rent. They're trying not to get right. run off the land. They're trying to resist violence and domination. Um, and if you forget that background, you're gonna misunderstand what people are up to. So the empire has no clothes was a paper that was trying to say, that's not just, you know, that's obviously an insight that really matters if we're talking about African Americans after the Civil War or something like that, but it's just true in general. Like what people do has to do with power relations. And so the emperor has no clothes is this old story where, you know, people that serve the emperor bring him an empty clothes hanger and they tell him that it has the most beautiful robe, but only competent people can see the robe. So he walks around naked pretending he's wearing this robe and for a while, a bunch of people pretend along with them, right? Because right. they're afraid what's going to happen if they don't. Um, eventually, someone, um, a kid, I think in the early version of the story, a kid says the emperor is naked and, you know, everybody stops playing along and then everybody laughs at the emperor, right? Um, the point of telling that story was to say, that's what a lot of these systems are like. We spend a lot of time in the academy, you know, pretending that, you know, power structures are a lot more subtle than they are right. about power and dominance, but they're really not, you know, like, um, even in the U.S., I mean, half of rap music in the 90s was about how the police did this or that fucked up thing, or right. you know, we don't like the state, we don't like the feds, we don't like ATF for such and such reasons. It's not really that, you know, it's not that veiled. It might seem veiled if you're a middle-class academic who grew up in the suburbs or whatever, um, but that's not the only part of the world we should be accountable to. So that was the basic starting point. And then along the way, I talk about agenda setting, which is this just this, this idea that the incentive structures that the powerful can create um, determine how we act in the world. It de determines what questions we feel safe asking. Um, it determines what kinds of political goals we feel safe pursuing. Um, and so that's the explanation of what kind of politics people do and not necessarily just what ideologies are floating around. Right, and I know you, uh, you know, in the, in the story, the little, like you said, the little girls, like, Ha, ha, he doesn't have any clothes on um but you talked about how people have their private beliefs but it, it may not reflect their public actions um so i think sometimes with black people we're seen as um why why don't we try this or you know people will say that why don't they try that and it's not that maybe those things couldn't help i don't know uh but is it that simple as just like trying something 
um, you know, or or is like you said, are there bigger, bigger things at play there? Yeah, I think there are bigger things at play, and they're the they're the agenda setting things, right? You know, the reason why it's a kid who says the emperor has no clothes is because the adults, you know, in a sense, know better, right? right. Everybody knows that the emperor doesn't have any clothes, right. but what the adults understand is there's all these you know, there's all these really messed up things that could happen to you if you point something like that out, if you embarrass the person in power. And in the same, you know, the same kind of thinking, you know, yeah, it would be great if there were um, a really strong militant labor movement. Yeah, it would be great if we tried this organizing strategy to get Congress people to pass the right laws. It would be great if we did this, it would be great if we did that. But all that, you know, competes with all the other stuff that we have to do, right? And if we don't even have the basic organizational infrastructure to even start pursuing those strategies, if the first thing that we have to do is build up the organizations because the federal government spent the 60s and 70s terrorizing and incarcerating them out of existence. Right. <laughs> right. You know, it makes a lot more sense why people might not focus on those particular strategies and people might focus either on their day-to-day -day life or people might, you know, try other things politically. All that stuff is hard to do. And if we want people to do it, we should spend less time scolding them for not doing it and more time making it easier for people to do those things. Right, right. And I guess even with the myth today um, of trickle-down Blackness, I think even even sometimes people like myself and you know people probably both of us who are on the, you know the left whatever probably sometimes critical we're very critical of the, that idea rightfully so but i think i guess what we're trying to do also is give some context to how that even happens right so it's not necessarily to your point if people have maybe more radical beliefs possibly or not but they have been influenced by a certain consequences <laughs> to to yeah. trying those yeah. things uh, then, you know, it, it something else fills that vacuum. But I think what's happened, uh, this is kind of, I guess, my look, outlook on it is, is that that idea of trickle down blackness just it's just safer. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> so it's safer where if I make it somewhere, then I can put everybody on or whatever. Right. That's just a, it's 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 a it's a sanctioned thing by by the state, you know, by power. Uh, so I guess the question with that is, how do we combat that without it being just kind of this scolding nature of everybody's a sellout or, uh, you know, every everything gets co-opted? I mean, a lot of it does. And there are sellouts. Like, I'm not saying that these people don't exist or this doesn't occur, but I guess it's like, like we were talking about before we started, it's a bit more complicated than that. So um, first of all, I guess my question would be, do, would you agree that that that's what it is or do you think it's something else as far as like how we how that that becomes like the mainstream way that we engage in politics as far as it's kind of like you know trickle down blackness or, or racial economics and then also um how do we reconstitute that i guess or is, is it something to reconstitute i don't want to be too deterministic but mm -hmm. yeah i mean I, I think it is something to reconstitute i think Half of it is the the point you just made, right? Where it's just safer, you know, to interpret racial justice as let's try and get Kamala Harris in the White House or right. Muriel Bowser as the DC mayor or whatever it is. Um, it's safer. Um, so there's some people who steer into that safety because that's really what they want out of racial justice rhetoric, right? right so that's right. more of a sellout direction, right? Yeah. But there's also people who lean into that because they look around at what our other resources are and they don't see any other attainable targets, mm. right? So there's some people who would be down for um, a debtor's strike if we had strong, well-knit debtor's unions, but they look around and don't see any and they're like, okay, well, you know, let me know when that option's on the table. Right now, the options on the table are get somebody who looks like me or, you know, says the right, you know, speaks in the right political language 
in the office because that's the thing I think we can do. So I think the I think the thing that we can do is, you know, base building. And it's not going to look like what it looked like a hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not to say that, you know, organized labor is always going to be a big part of this kind of thing, but it's not, you know, we, we also got to think about other kinds of things, right? You know, this century, it might be tenants unions might be the thing that we need to do, or, you know, it might be another, it might be another Garvey kind of thing, maybe less black star line, but more, Cooperative or something. cultural nationalist yeah right, right. you know i don't know what it's going to be but it has to be something that answers the fact that decades ago we had much stronger community organizations non-state organizations and the government in some cases um it was a happy coincidence of other things that they tried to do and in the case of like COINTELPRO and fighting the radical left it was a very deliberate strategy right right um, in either case um they have there has been a monumentally strong and well resourced effort by the state and billionaires to destroy organized opposition that did not represent the interests of either the federal government or capital um and until we build organizational capacity until we build power outside of that um we're gonna be you know we're gonna be stuck with the solutions they offer us which is representation right yeah power funds its own opposition i get i guess two things off of that uh for one, I guess just to kind of speak to the myth itself, why does it for people who might still kind of be bought into this representation or even I guess I don't even really think it's that it's just like a success story that's supposed to trickle down. Um, but why doesn't that work? Um, you know, like, why can't that work? Why can't we get I'm just kind of playing that other side. Why can't we get more black people in positions of power and why can't they look out for us and you know, send those resources back? Why can't we find ourselves in a better material condition? Why can't the masses of the of, of our lives change? Like, why can't it do that? It seems like we've made progress. You know, once upon a time, we were all, you know, living under Jim Crow. Now we've had a black president, we have a black vice president, we have black entertainers, we have, you know, black people all over the te- television. Um, somehow there's a weird correlation between somebody's neck getting stepped on and people getting corporate board seats but what i'm saying like you know why can't we why can't those things work like I, i'm just saying like i guess just to just, just to ask the question yeah i mean it's a good question and i sometimes i wonder if we were living in the world 100 years ago you know maybe it would have worked or at least worked better than in this world but right now we're dealing with two problems. Um, One is kind of in terms of how we think about the black elite, Mm -hmm. right? Being part of the black elite in the era of segregation, right? Just to use the US as where we're thinking about in the era of segregation um, and in the era of kind of less complicated and just fewer connections between capital over here and capital over there it just meant a different thing than it means now like if you even if you were a black doctor you more likely than not lived in a black community and your fate was tied up with what Mm -hmm. happened to black people um and you were answerable to organized groups of black people you know you might hear from um you know, if we're talking decades ago, you might hear from the Nation of Islam, or you might hear from CORE, or you might hear from um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. If you said something that, you know, didn't match up with where the Black masses were at politically, even if you in particular were a Black doctor or a Black professor or whatever, whatever. So there were forms of accountability and there were forms of social connection which have been eroded by mass incarceration, which have been eroded by 
the global war on the left, which have been eroded by right to work legislation, the assaults on unions. And so the they're just, and, yeah. yeah, 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 and integration. So there's just, you know, there aren't the, there aren't the ways of calling black elites to the overall black cause that there would have been a hundred years ago. So, so that's just to say something about the black elite and why, you know, putting them into power isn't obviously going to be the route to freedom. But even if, you know, even if we set all that aside, even if we thought, you know, maybe just ideologically or maybe just some other way, we got the black elite to the cause of black liberation, right? Of black liberation for all black people and not just right. well off black people. Um, even if that happened, their ability to pursue that strategy is, you know, they're answering to a lot larger set of forces um, and different set of forces um, that are the actual government of this world. So just to give a concrete example, um, the housing market, I believe as of this year, is now over 50% corporate owned. Mm. These corporations are often shell companies controlled by investors from all parts of the world. That's going to include the illicit global economy and drugs. That's going to include, you know, Russian oligarchs. That's going to include um, uh, petroleum titans from Canada and the United Arab Emirates, right? And those people are deciding whether or not Black people here um have housing or get evicted, mm. right? And even Kamala Harris just isn't in a position to, you know, intervene on that in any direct way because that's just, you know, not something that capitalist state legislatures have given themselves the task of dealing with, right? And even if they were to try to get it, you know, all that money from all the parts of the world is gonna buy all the other Republicans, you know, senators and Congress people to oppose that legislation, all right? So, you know, while- So would that be mm -hmm. kind of back to your point about the incentive structures um, and, and the agenda setting, that's, sounds like they're setting an agenda um, and then everyone else is put in motion to respond to it. Um, so if one politician wants to act on good faith, I guess, for, for lack of a better term, even if they wanted to do that, and I, I'm not one of those people who wants to give politicians excuses for doing nothing, but I'm saying mm -hmm. even if they act on it, there's there's an apparatus in place that can turn the whole thing against them, even if they try to buck the system. Are, is, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, exactly. You know, I always think back to the, you know, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. I go, Mama didn't even want to solve the problem, right? <laughs> Obama just wanted reform. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was just like, let's change the number of people bankrupted and you know, left out in the cold by this healthcare system from this number of tens of millions to this smaller number of tens of millions. And even that, like the entire forces of capital, you know, conspired to, you know, limit the scope of that and then to roll it back once the Republicans got in office. Um, so imagine if he had actually, you know, imagine if, if he had wanted single payer or something like that. Right, which he had on. Um, exactly which yeah. he pretended to want yeah right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's like it's it's and i guess that's the thing that's where i think there's a confluence there because like on one level there's a there's the the system that does turn on you but then it's like you have you have people who've been socialized to the point where they don't even go for the gusto anyway right like they're just right. like well you know let's 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 try to like reduce the amount of people who die every year let's not give them health care but let's like reduce it and give some of them health care even if it's a shitty version of it that's mm -hmm. just a bad bill for a lot of folks because it's not even worth 
going to the doctor for, but let's give them that or, you know, let's finally, like we see right now, let's finally raise the minimum wage, maybe, uh, you know, after 40 years of never, 50, 40, 50 years of, of wages not really going up or let's, you know, like, like the most minimal things um, come across the, they, they'll push the most minimal things. And I think that's the part that pisses me off. And that's why yeah, your, your work kind of helps me on a level because I, I have a hard time not making it a moral just a moral thing with these people because it's like you're you're just gonna you know like you know how bad this is but you're gonna put the most like middle of the road solution um mm -hmm. to the problem once it reaches its, its its head so like even with the police um after all of that shit finally reached its head this summer as far as you know people out in mass now we finally get some of the the best quote-unquote reforms in a bill you know, but we mm -hmm. couldn't even get that. And we and those reforms don't even work. But I'm just saying, like, now it's reforms. So right. it's like, right. at some point, you know, that's why I think for some Black folks, it's like they look at these people and it's like, you really are just stooges. Like, you're just here to kind of just keep us at bay. Is that is that wrong to feel that way? <laughs> I mean. No, I think it's exactly, I think it's exactly right. And I think you know, one of the one of the things that's clarifying about studying this in the context of colonialism, mm. um, and I'm on, you know, I'm on Ture and Hamilton's team and Kenneth Clark's team. You know, all the the like African American theorists who are like, you know, this is domestic colonialism mm. because in colonialism in other places, you know, the empires were just very explicit about this. We're gonna have us at the top. We're gonna have a buffer class of people in the middle whose job it is to make sure that the people at the bottom don't fuck with the program. Right. Right. And that's gonna be different people, different places, you know, in the Caribbean, maybe it's the mixed race Creoles, you know, in the in um on the African continent, a lot of times it was a particular ethnic group that got to be the buffer class or the the assimilated um quote unquote natives that got to be the class in the middle or the so-called comprador class, but it's just a part of the structure of how this thing works. But there's gonna be go-betweens between power and the rest of us. So I kind of move to your next article. Elite capture and identity politics, you say um, the concept of elite capture originated in the study of developing countries to describe the way Socially advantaged people tend to gain control over financial benefits meant for everyone, especially foreign aid. But the concept has been applied more generally to describe how political projects can be hijacked in principle or in effect by well position and resource. Um, and so I, that to me speaks directly to the class we're talking about. Um, so are so there are are they placed in a position um, on purpose? you're saying, or is this just how things play out just naturally almost? Yeah, it's one of those things that evolves because it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So in the like better managed empires, they come in with this strategy and started immediately. The US is a weird case just because it started from, you know, this weird mix of settler colonialism and this huge scale of racism so the middle managers were part of you know they were the majority of the white population whatever and so they had to build an idea of democracy around that um i mean my impulse would be to think that um it would evolve naturally in the places where it wasn't an explicit strategy i think in the u.s it is a strategy i think you know, I think people cook that up um, at several points, but especially like at the beginning of the Cold War, mm -hmm. people are just like, we got to do something about these people here in our backyard and also all these other countries that are looking at some other way of managing politics and economics. Which right. 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 So I'm sorry, I cut you off what you said, Dan. Oh, I just said it would have been, which was communism at the time. Right, right. Yeah, we did a show with um, Dr. Ball and um, Dr. CBS 
and we pretty much just tackled that whole 40s and 50s era and the the amount of propaganda and and repression that came out of that era i don't even think we talk a lot about Cointel Pro, but that era is just as bad, in my opinion. Um, if we're yeah. <laughs> if we're really looking yeah. into into what was done, um, so I guess like we talked we talked about you know this this idea of how how blackness is trickles down in some ways, but I guess like in the in the piece with the identity politics, you talk about elite capture and how identity politics specifically didn't originate obviously from this this being this idea of just put black people or whatever you know dispar despair group in the high places and just move on and just hope that that works but how like that seems to continually happen um and i guess that's what i'm just i keep asking like we find ourselves in this position over and over again like i know with with even like the millennials of my age around early 30s or whatever there was this belief that you know we could at least this is how i saw it we could get the if we we could um change the language um you know so we started putting in more academic terms just the mainstream you know everybody's talking about intersectionality or everybody's talking about privilege or uh, trauma and all these different things that if we can have more open conversations about about so-called you know disparities or racism or whatever isms then it could it could transform society and what it seems to have happened uh, <laughs> is that that stuff has been adopted into the very society we were trying to fight like i remember when the democratic party once upon a time was um was like all lives matter and then eventually they were just like you know what black lives do matter uh, <laughs> and it, <laughs> it reminded me H. Rat Brown had a speech way back in the day and he talked about how the first political victory that black people won in this country was the fact that they said that we are black. They established the fact that, you know, we will not be recognized as Negroes, we are black. The man said, wow, Jim, you know, okay. He said, you know, we'll concede that. We concede blackness to you. But we will not concede revolutionary struggle. We will not concede revolutionary nationalism. We'll concede black because then he still can sell that program about, you know, like the whole thing of integrating, the whole thing of blacks integrating with whites. He just changed the word. Next thing you know, like they're they're on somebody's corporate uh, board or they're on somebody's like corporate um, um, ch chair against racism or something or a panel fighting racism at this institution or um, so Chase probably has a Chase has diversity. Um, Disney has Disney's got a huge diversity campaign and they're all saying they're going to fight racism. Everybody put out an equity statement this year or this past year. But yet we're still here. So like, how does that how does that keep happening? Yeah, there was a thing that um, Adolph Reed said when he was um, criticizing reparations. Mm. And he he's like, well, if you look at reparations demands, they include some things that are addressed at institutions. They include some things that are direct are addressed at economics, right? Give people checks, and they include some symbolic things, um, which are you know apologies or memorials, that kind of thing. And the problem, you know, in one sense, that's good because you know. It's comprehensive. It addresses all the things that we should address. Um, but the political problem with doing that is if you don't say what's more important than what, then that gives the power structure the idea to decide which of those concessions to give you and call it a compromise. And he says they're always going to choose the symbolic thing um, because it doesn't cost them anything that they, it doesn't cost them what they care most about, put it that way, right? right. So, you know, um, I remember back in the summer watching Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and all them Neil and Kente cloth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just like promising myself, like by the end of this year, some fucked up thing was going to happen. I turned out to be, well, I mean, I'm sure some fucked up thing happened, but the thing that reminded me of that was, I think 
last week, Nancy Pelosi handed her, you know, handed these special commemorative coins to all the people on the Capitol Police. Mm. And I, I just remember thinking, you know, that's that's really that's really what we're talking about. We're not even not even we're we're not even talking about symbolic consistency. That's what kills me. <laughs> Right. You're not even symbolically consistent on this on this issue, you know, symbolically consistent, but still, you know, defending the system. A better example of that is in D.C., Muriel Bowser had Black Lives Matter spray painted on the plaza Mm -hmm. near the White House. And then days later, the cops, you know, were beating up Black Lives Matter protesters on that on those on the letters. In Black Lives Matter Plaza, as, yeah. on Black Lives Matter Plaza, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> and you know, these are the examples I think about. You know, at, at the end of the day, there's there's a variety of concerns and there's a variety of problems that come with racial justice, and they are not equally distributed across populations. Right. So, you know, one of the one of the things that has to do with racism is environmental racism and the thing that happened in Flint and getting your water poisoned. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that has to do with racism is um, getting stopped and frisked by the NYPD thousands upon thousands of times in the span of a few years. Um, one of the things that has to do with racism is mass incarceration or the sexual violence that sex workers face. These are all things that have to do with racism, but the things that will personally show up in the lives of class mobile, the kinds of class mobile, well-connected people that write think pieces about racism and serve in the JP Morgan, you know, Ida B. Wells Memorial, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> corporate <laughs> seminar <laughs> but i mean like the things that are going to be relatable to the people who are most in a position to affect how discourse on racism goes in elite spaces aren't going to be those things and i think that's just you know even if you even if you set aside you know, ideology, just like what do the people in elite spaces relate to most powerfully? Some of them, you know, some of them came from working class backgrounds. I'm not Mm. saying that's not true, right? Some of them have dealt with this stuff. I'm just saying percentage wise, you know, it's likely that the thing that person in the corporate boardroom relates to is, you know, not being taken seriously because of their race or, um, Mm -hmm you know, not having people accept the symbolism that they like or the entertainment TV shows that they like, so on and so forth. Yeah. It's not that they don't matter at all. It's just that they're not the ball game. Yeah, and I, 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 I find to that point, <laughs> I don't be Wells, but like the, the privilege, the, the privilege discourse um, is, is, I think, uh, highly correlational to that, right? So, the the idea that some that that a white person is, I mean, I don't know. I'm just gonna be straight. Sometimes it just comes off like people don't like folks being mean to them, and that's really all this is about. And 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 the one and the bigger issue with that is the disservice it does is it makes it makes us think that racism is as opposed to being flint like you talked about uh, or or uh you know stop and frisk it's i I, as a white person need to stop being mean to my black co-worker and and so we take all of these workshops so we can be nicer to each other so we can still go out and exploit and make money off of whatever our job is but we just need to be more at peace with within our relations so it just becomes a kind of a, a labor relations strategy essentially more so than it is um, any type of redistributive project. It's just like, well, I need to, and, and it also seems to be correlating with, uh, you know, this whole like majority minority BS that they keep putting out. Um, 
So it makes sense that you need to be more culturally attuned because there are more people of color, so to speak. So it makes sense that now that becomes more of a dialogue than it was in like 1990 when white people were still 70 plus percent of the population. And, you know, but now they understand, even though they're going to still be the majority, I don't know why people keep saying that, but, but, but like they're, they're going to be less of a majority than, than they once were. So it makes sense. But you're right. Like the, I even know in, in the poetry world where I perform sometimes, like there's a, unfortunately sometimes an obsession with talking about how talking about privilege all the time. And again, I don't think it's a completely bad conversation, but it, oh, it tends to focus on these like individual interactions about how somebody was mean to you. Um, right. And not so much about like the systematic things, even though people use those words, they'll say systemic institutional or whatever. But when you listen to what they're really saying, it's usually like just somebody was mean to me. And I'm not right. saying people should be mean to people, but I'm saying like, that's, that's often what I hear. And I know that sounds cold, but I guess like, that tends to fit a particular like class um, narrative where you want to have a, I understand it. Like it's, it's practical. You want to go to, to your job and be respected. You don't want to be bothered. You don't want somebody calling you out of your name. You don't want somebody that's culturally ignorant. Like it makes the work environment hard, but then because they control the, the narratives because they're in those positions, those become the things that we talk about. Yeah. And then how can we, uh, make it easier for the black girl or the black boy or the black person who's gr who's growing up the black child so they when they get here you know it's not as much of a toxic environment like that that seems to be like the the general narrative um and i don't know it's it's it 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 if they keep framing the narrative kind of to your point about the incentive structure where their issues get centered and then it redistributes itself to where we think that's the actual problem. Um, right. You know, um, so is that is that part of that kind of dynamic of the incentive structuring where like, or the even the elite capture where they, they kind of set the, or I think you said in your piece of the value capture, which if you could add kind of speak on that in reference to what I said. Yeah, that's, 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 right on that's exactly how i think it works um and i think you know in some ways what i was trying to do was you know in in the first paper was be like well you know when you're tracking what people do you got to track the power dynamics and sound structures it's not all about beliefs in this abstract way mm -hmm. that ignores context but on the other hand, in a way, like this kind of dynamic that you're explaining in the long term becomes pretty close to the kind of ideology belief story. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, now people are, after elite capture, people are growing up in an environment or, you know, or people are being exposed to this environment where having serious conversations about racial justice just means you know, meeting the Ida B. Wells coordinator of J.P. Morgan and figuring <laughs> out how not to be mean to your Black coworkers, right? Right. right. So they figure out, you know, what kind of competency will let them be nice to their coworkers. And they genuinely believe, oh, I'm on team anti-racism. Um, and in a sense, they are. But like what they think that those values mean, and I think it was good that you brought up, or I think it was helpful you brought up value capture, right? Like what those values mean in terms of what people do and how people actually behave and you know what thing pe what progress people make and try to make just means like how to be nice to my coworkers because that's what people have a blueprint for. That's the version of things that's easy to find and easy to participate in. Mm -hmm. And so I think it circles back to what we were saying um, earlier on the conversation, which is like, how do you, how do we make a different way of living out anti-racist values easy for people to find and easy for people to participate in, and easy for people to think about? The stuff about like privilege and um, and and implicit bias and um 
like these things are these things are very individualized. Like I don't need to join an organization to deal with that. <laughs> so right. you know what I'm saying? Right. Like nobody has to join an organization to be to deal with quote unquote privilege. No one has to collectively work together. Um, you know, in any in any real sense beyond the job market to deal with privilege. That's something that you get a workshop on, you read, you can go in a book club, and that's like the, the most collective it gets. But I don't need to necessarily join in anything that is trying to shape a larger world if all I need to do is work on my biases. Um, you know, so so is there is there something is is I know you talked about in the in the deference in the elite capture deference piece um, how you know this idea of centering uh, certain groups in a room, but you you also earlier talked about base building. Is does do, do these things conflict with base building? I think so, and I think you know your frame is the reason why. So you take a you take a concept like privilege. Um, and, and maybe in a different world, it wouldn't have to work this way, but this is how it seems to work as people use it. What is, you know, what is like, check your privilege or that kind of thing? What does it ask you to do? Right. Well, it takes the two or three or four, however many of us in this room, it takes the dynamics of that room um, and it says, well, look at how the institutions, look at how we say the institutions set up the power dynamics of their room, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it isn't even always an honest depiction of the power dynamics in that room, but just set that aside for a second. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> um, you know, you're um, a cis man, so, um, or a cis woman, whatever, you know, pick your example. Um, and so, patriarchy gives you this and this and it doesn't give me that and so how we should move forward in this conversation is you should uh, maybe defer to me is one way it can go mm -hmm. or you should um, be less confident in the thing you're saying or you know there's different versions but you should change how you're showing up in this room and you know, then question mark, question mark. Then we challenge the actual patch patriarchy, right? And I don't know, <laughs> you know, I have very rarely seen someone even try to like fill out the story of how we get from that first thing, which people seem to have a lot of emphasis on and people seem to have, you know, lots of ideas about how to do challenging the power dynamics of this conversation or this space, you know, um, there isn't a story about how we challenge the broader dynamics. And I think it's not just that, you know, I think part of the, the absence of that story is baked into these ideas in the first place, right? Like, like take the concept of privilege um, and think to an era like the Vietnam War draft, right? Mm. Um, so maybe there's a privilege in the sense that like maybe the imperial government we live in is gonna call up two of my sons to go f die in this oppressive war against another country um, and only one of your sons, right? So right. Um, we have a decision to make, right? Obviously, things are worse for me in some sense than the other person. But do we want to focus on comparing us to each other? Or do we want to notice that both of us have, both of us who love our children want to stop this war from happening, stop this draft from happening, so on and so forth, right? Right, right, if we, right. If we were interested in that second thing, I don't think we would describe that difference as privilege. You know, right. The, the privilege of burying one child instead of two. Mm, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that would be our attitude towards differences and level of oppression. Right. Um, but I think that's, you know, I think it's indicative of a discourse on oppression that is meant to solve clout problems mm. rather than 
oppression problems. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 that's a great analogy and an unfortunate one at the same time, um, because, yeah, I mean. And I, I, I noticed it's hard to have that conversation, because if you. You know, if you point out like, yeah, we're 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 both going to war. Right. <laughs> and then somebody's yeah. like, but you're being a reductionist or what, you know, and it's like. Or, you know, you're, you're, you're being insensitive or you don't care about my pain. You're not, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. I, I think we should be sensitive to the fact that, yeah, if there was, if there's two to one soldiers, like that does matter. Or, you know, we know with Vietnam, right. like soldiers got, they, they lowered the grade level and, uh, and they put mm -hmm. black soldiers at the front of the, 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 um, the line and stuff like that. We know that happened, but like, you know, what was it like 70,000 people died in Vietnam. Uh, regardless of, of the, the disparities. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't, I, again, is that, um, uh, is that, I don't want to, I don't want to get conspiratorial and say that that's on purpose. I don't know. I really don't, but there does seem to be an emphasis on how you have more scraps than I have sometimes. Like that seems right. to be how we talk about privilege, right? Like it, you, you have a few more scraps and even though I agree with the general assessment that yes, a poor white person, for instance, is still you know pr has has a certain skin privilege over over a black person. Like I don't mm -hmm. disagree with that. I I think what you're saying is the emphasis on those things. Um, not that they're not real, but the emphasis on them is the is more so the problem. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly it. Right. Those those differences are real, but. You know, the question is like, what does the difference mean? Mm -hmm. And what, are, what is it that we're trying to do about the difference is another way to put it. Right. So like if we're trying to, and I think it again circles back to the conversation where we were have, having earlier, if we start to think about why this is happening. Because I think if people thought, if people truly believed that they could challenge the housing system, then they'd be more motivated to be like, okay, well, you know, I recognize that I'm more likely to be evicted because I'm a black woman than um, a white woman would be, or a black single mother than a white single mother would be. Um, but we're on the same side in terms of this specific campaign to, you know, um, outlaw evictions and cancel rent, for example, right? Um, if if people thought they could win that battle, I think they'd be more willing to um, think about real differences in oppression differently. And I think the fact that people think about privilege discourse and use privilege discourse reflects the fact that people think, well, the only battle I can win is changing whether or not people are mean to me or people mm -hmm. appreciate my level of oppression and so on and so forth. So if I'm going to care about racial justice, that's where my investment is gonna go. Right, right. So it's so kind of like, like you said to what we were saying, it's not always that that is maybe what you ultimately believe is the best option. Like if it was just up to you as an individual, but that that's the avenue that's given to you to express your grievances, um, you know, on right. some scale, right? So, um, you know, I, I see that a lot with, you know, college students, especially with that, that there's a lot of this type of discourse, um, you know, as far as privilege and all of that, but that's, but that's also seems to be where, where our, our, our grievances are being funneled um, is towards that kind of like, you're you're a privileged blah 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 and you know or even even within even within the black community like like all of the different things that get debated like colorism um you know again it's not to say colorism isn't a thing but i was i was just on a call or i had to do a workshop yesterday and and we didn't even we weren't even talking about colorism we actually were doing a workshop presenting the, the breakdown of this podcast and somebody randomly gets on the end. It's like, can you guys talk about colorism in the black community and and um how, and house Negroes and field Negroes? And I was just like, one, well, I don't even know why you asking me this because it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> but so 
she mainly focused on I don't want to call out this person but the, the her her grievances were mainly like how we are mean to each other again like that 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 thing seems to be centered and I try to reframe it as to say well yeah I mean, colorism is a thing but we also got to deal with like the class dynamics that colorism perpetuates and you know the proximity to white capital and all. like we have to look at it in the structural sense not just why are we mean to each other right. um but I think there's a tough it's a tough conversation to talk about. You've been alluding to it all the whole time we've been talking about priorities and mm. a pecking order. And I think that's where it gets wrong because it's people feel like if you say we should fight for housing rights, um, they it's, it becomes this either or thing, right? So just right. because you might say something's a priority here, it doesn't mean we should be sexist assholes either. Right. You know what I'm saying? We're not saying right. that, but I think that's kind of, have you noticed like a similar trend where if you say that, then it's almost like anything that you're not putting above that is is seen as dismissed? Yeah, I've, I've definitely, you know, noticed that in conversations and it's been, you know, it's been tough to think about how to, you know, how to make clear to people that, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't matter how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. In fact, it you know, in fact, if we're going to solve any of these big problems, then it really matters how we treat each other. Right. Like we're not going to be able to stay together and fight the bosses or the landlords or the creditors if we can't treat each other with respect. And beyond that, we all just deserve respect as human beings, right? regardless of what happens with this other stuff. But, you know people i think i think in large part because these kinds of arguments are so strongly associated with like white bro leftists who are mm -hmm. class reductionists or something right, right. Um, which is you know not at all how i think about the world but i get why people hear that in some of these individual things that i say have taken out of context um yeah, I, I, but I, you know, people hear that as being told to shut up and that what they're feeling doesn't matter. And I think that is, you know, I think that's tied to, you know, that's kind of the social imprint of our, you know, lack of community organizations and lack of all these kind of organic relations of accountability and respect and community right where you know some of what people are reaching for and left thought are kind of practical solutions to particular problems but i think the other thing that people are reaching for is you know finally a space where they can belong and feel accepted and feel mm. respected and feel loved and people don't have that and, you know, this, you know, cultivating a community that accepts this or that line on colorism or this or that line on, um, you know, whatever other social issue is a way for some people to get that thing that they've been denied. And I think we have to think seriously about how to build that in ways that don't you know, ignore the larger issues of mm -hmm. whatever, of, of housing or intimate partner violence or um, immigration or whatever it is. Um, but that takes these other issues seriously internally. Right, yeah, because it, it seems like it's just hard to, um, there's like an, it's like an either, it's an either or, so like everything has to be addressed or nothing has to be addressed. I was I was in a debate. It was it was like a, a, a planned debate, and the and the resolution was um it was nothing yeah. is nothing is um politically right that is morally wrong. That's what it was. Uh, but essentially, the point was, if it's politically expedient to do something, um, mm -hmm. but it might have moral implications that don't work for every segment of the community, 
then then it shouldn't be done at all. <clears throat> um, and I I was I was debating the negative on this. I didn't even I didn't I had to actually argue something I didn't even actually agree with. I I probably sound like a conservative in that debate, uh, but but it was interesting. It was interesting to get on the other side of it. That was you know it was like utilitarian kind of argument or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think we really wrestle with that. Like I was the 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 example we used in that debate. Uh, or like the the not the example but the prompt we kind of used was um was Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks and, and mm. um, you know Al, Al Rosa Parks was was obviously more privileged in that sense she's light skinned she's middle class she's part of the NAACP she belongs to an organization and Claudette Colvin was not represented in that sense she's darker skinned she's she had a baby and she was young she's like 17 16 17 um and the NWCB did not did not support her um, when she said, "I don't want to, you know, sit on the back of the bus." They supported Rosa Parks, and I'm always conflicted on that story. If I'm being honest, even to this day, despite all my kind of like issues with the black middle class and everything, I'm always conflicted on that story because it's like then they they were able to get real material gains from that, um, you know. Right. But is that the type of community we want to construct where we just choose what's the most expedient cause, you know, at the cost of of other individuals, right? Like, you know, right. I, don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? But yeah, I mean, I think that's too far. Um, but I think a lot of the trade-offs that we're worried about are better thought of as questions about how we should do the politically expedient thing than whether, mm -hmm. right? So, so you know, it's not like the choices are like throw dirt on Claudette Colvin's name and pretend Rosa Parks is the only person that ever existed that right, fought right, right. this way, right? Um, you know, I think there are ways to, you know, use the system's hierarchies against it that don't throw people under the bus. Um, and I think there are usually political options like that. But in general, I think like, I can't square, you know, there's a lot of people that I've met over the years that talk real, that talk, that talk really radical, that talk really militant, and right, that right, are, right. you know, all about invoking the idea of revolutionary things and just, but at the same time, you know, anything that even smells of slight moral compromise, they can't abide. And I'm just like, how do y'all, like, how clean do y'all you, do think the Haitian revolution was? Right, right? right. Like, if you're talking about the violent overthrow of a world system, you're going to have to make deeper compromises than the occasional conversation with someone who voted for the wrong person or something. I don't know. Like, no, that's know, like, yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, I think there are fewer problems with moral compromises than with serious with, I think there are fewer problems with mild moral compromise than people pretend because usually there's some better option. Um, but I think we also have to make peace with having some, you know, we have to have principles, we have to have things we won't do. Um, but they, but if they're so stringent that we can't succeed in anything that we're trying to do, then maybe we should revisit those commitments. Right, right. Because it's like, and I think this kind of all comes back to this, this, the, the elite capture and the trickle down blackness, because again, um, if I can find the quote, you said, if elite capture boils down to the way power and resources tend to be distributed within groups and not simply across groups, then it is a general problem of politics in a world that distributes power and resources unjustly and unequally. Elites get outsized control over their ideas and circulation about, about identities by more or less the same methods and for the same reasons they get to control everything else. So neoliberalism uh, kind of controls this, this idea of individual freedom as being the, the primary source that we lean on um, to, to recognize our own kind of sense of 
personal liberation, right? Uh, and that plays into how I think we can't make those those decisions. Because when I did that debate, one thing I did agree with, I was I, that I did say, like I would actually agree with if it was me, um, was um, was that you know we don't live in a moral society, so expecting black people to make these perfectly moral decisions, you know, particularly under the 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 guise of Jim Crow. I think is uh, is 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 you're, you're looking at it from the perspective of of the elite who look down on mm-hmm. folks and have these like moral judgments. Because if you're in that position, if you're in the trenches, like you say, if you're talking about a violent overthrow of a world system, there are going to have to be certain moral compromises. I don't think that's a, something we really need to have a conversation about more. Like you're not going to get everything. This isn't a utopia. You know what I'm saying? Like. Right. And it's right. not to say again. It's not to say you know we, we um, we create these false narratives where it's like we'll just beat up our women until we get free. No, nobody's saying that. Right, right. You know, right. like you said, there's still a way to do things, but there is something to be said about like, you know, every slight, every issue, every time something goes wrong, it doesn't always have to be this um, this kind of like, you know, okay, I'm walking away now. Um, because it just right. seems to be a general sense of again, I don't want to join an organization with people. Like I've I've learned I've come to see that more as I've gotten older. Like that's ultimately what this leads to. And even myself, I've probably been guilty of that. Like I don't really want to, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. These they're fake, whatever. And I'm you know I'm gonna go do me. I'm gonna go do me. And then it just kind of becomes what we talked about with the trickle down blackness like we, even if we're not in elite positions we still kind of think like okay i'm gonna just go do me i'm gonna do my work i'm gonna feed the community and you and so you believe your individual success once again will kind of trickle back down even right. if it's on a much lower scale like i'm not going to be a celebrity or i'm not going to be a millionaire but even if i can you know get a good job or i can um get some influence here and there then that can i can i can do that because i'm tired of organizations and people and I don't, and I'm, I ask you to give me a solution to that because I don't really believe in like one handed solutions, but just to kind of, you know, as we kind of wind this down, like I, I'm more so curious, like, <clears throat> you know, how do we work through that? I know we've talked about it a little bit, but just as far as like there, this consistent push to um, not work together. And I don't mean that in a utopian sense, so I'm saying for people who do say, like you said, revolution or, Black people need this. You're not doing that with, you know, buy black campaigns once a year and a, a scholarship for one or two kids out of the hood. Like you're not gonna fix those problems with stuff like that. Right. You're not. So yeah, this is a really. I think this is the this is the exact right place to expand it. So before it was like, you're not gonna do it by perfect, totally unblemished actions. And you're also only, and you're also not going to do it with perfect, totally unblemished people. Right. Like that's the thing I find most alienating about the about the about the push that you're talking about, where it's just like, you know, I don't like this person, and it's not, you know, I think this person's presence is counter revolutionary. Right. It's I think this person said or did this problematic thing that I don't like, or or maybe I just don't like them. It, it might not even be a problematic thing. And so I can't, you know, I can't share space with them. I can't share an organization with them. Um, and I think this is this is anti-political. It's anti-political in the in a really practical way that you were describing, right? Which is just like, you know. It's going to take something bigger than me getting into a good job and getting mm-hmm. good influence. It's going to take way more than that if we want to change anything in the world we don't like. But I think maybe even more basic than that, you know, the the purpose of trying to change the world, I would think, is not out of love and concern for the abstract people that are getting crushed by this system, but love and concern for the actual people who are getting crushed right. by the system, right. who are unperfect, 
problematic ass people. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, you know, I'm in activists and organizing spaces all the time and I hear people, you know, describe, you know, as trash, like things that apply to, you know, 95% of the people that I love and respect yeah. on this earth. Yeah. Who, you know, who I want to change the system for, you know, I want them to live in a better world. It's not just something I and the five people in my cadre as the vanguard of the revolution are going to accomplish for ourselves, <laughs> and bestow on everybody else. Like, that's not what it's about. Um, and, and we have to, you know, we have to find a different way to relate to getting things wrong, even serious things wrong. And I think, you know, like that's what the, the, the people who are like prison abolitionists, the restorative justice, transformative justice stuff, you know, obviously there's lots of critiques about how this or that RJ or TJ process works, but you know, the thing that they're trying to figure out is the thing that we desperately need to figure out um, and need to move forward. Yeah, because I mean, you're talking about, like in that case, conflict resolution of some form. I mean, because conflict arises and it is true that, you know, some of our, our historic organizations, um, you didn't always deal with conflict in the best way or, you know, just kind of, yeah. you know, a lot of petty shit going on. Like that, that's definitely, that's definitely true when you read about what actually happened in some of those organizations, whether, you know, SNCC or NLHP or whatever. Um, but I, I was joking with somebody the other day. I was like, at least, I was like, yeah, we were dysfunctional, but at least we used to get shit done. You know, I was, right. I was just like, <laughs> I was just like, you know, we, like we might have, you know, it might have been a lot of bullshit, but at least like, you know, you showed up to the meeting and now it's just like, I don't even want to come, I'm tired of shit. So I guess that's that just because I guess that's the kind of the last question is like how how important is um this sense of personal freedom? Like I I, I guess that's what I'm really tired of and I struggle with. It's like it seems that personal freedom has become the ultimate sense of freedom. And I think that that is very much codified by how the system frames it, you know, and, and that's that's all in the marketing that we look at. Everything is very individualized, even down to your own phone. It fits kind of your world. Social media does that. You can kind of like, you can really niche your situation. And it seems like personal freedom becomes the end all be all. And I don't know, like, I think that that's, I don't want to say that's the root of the problem. I don't know what that even means anymore. Um, but that seems to be a real obstacle. Um, you know, is is that that is that that sense of personal freedom and personal liberation. I don't think, again, just like we said with everything else, I don't think it's because everybody's bad or they're just these horribly flawed folks or whatever. But it just seems like that has more and more become a a a, a important piece to life in eras where that just wasn't it that just didn't mean as much to people and you know i just, just it just didn't right, right. you know like, right i i definitely think so i think personal freedom i think i think this is where i get i'm pretty conspiratorial <laughs> <laughs> but but i really i really just think like there has been a there's been an effort to promote the idea of personal freedom and the the gadgets to capitalize on personal freedom not just because those things are individually profitable you know like mm -hmm. whatever all these things that we can do by ourselves but i think because from a bigger scale it is it is just the other side of the anti-union right to work movement. It yeah. just is the other side of destroying left organizations. It's just another way of agenda setting of making it hard for people to connect across difference, to have community and to do the kinds of, and to wield the kind of power that we can wield when we're not in our isolated little bubbles. Um, and I think, you know, our response to that interpretation of personal freedom 
that's apart from the community rather than um, built by or within the community, that, you know, which would be a better way of thinking about personal freedom, I think. Um, mm. I think that weaponization of personal freedom is something that we have to fight on the same scale as the corporations and ruling elite yeah. are because like they know it's not personal freedom that's why that's why jp morgan and the manufacturers association and facebook and twitter were all came after trump because they know it you know they know that destroying you know they know that challenging these structures flawed as they are isn't just a problem for congress it isn't just a problem for all these other things they spend millions of dollars lobbying yeah they're the main one that they're the ones that normally are bum rushing the capitals the lobbyists <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah. right like yeah. they know that there are collective and societal stakes for things and they know that none of this stuff is just personal which is why they spend so much effort controlling our you know and capturing our collective institutions um and preventing us from having ones from having institutions that they haven't captured um, yeah yeah and that's where the the black elite i think really is the that's where they really become a problem because their whole niche is about pushing personal freedom like all across the board even our politicians like obama and michelle obama like they're they're motivational speakers you know what i'm saying like, right. Like, they, right like like it's it's like her book was called literally becoming you know what i'm saying like it's it's all <laughs> it's just all in the in the in the language man like all of them do that and it's like so that's why I was saying at the beginning, it's not really about um, the, even a representation, because a representation would imply, even if it's a very bourgeois, you know, top down, it would still imply like, okay, I get in and we're going to kind of like do a reformist thing or whatever, right? Or, you know, we have some power and then we're going to kick some crumbs. But it's like, at this point, we're not even really getting crumbs. We really just get... Right to feel good that we see ourselves somewhere. And like, that's that's the extent of it. So so they promote that personal freedom in that sense of where like, I don't even have to believe in it, that the world itself needs any collective energy. I just need to believe in myself. And yeah. if I believe in myself, then I can I can do anything. You know, like that's how it comes off. And I, I just get annoyed, man. I'd be like, yo, like, and I see, I, I I sit with my friends and my family. I see how that impacts them. Um, and I even look at myself and how, you know, I was, I mean, I'm a big Jay-Z fan. Like, I'll never knock, like, my, my but but I look at, like, Jay-Z is the most aspirational type of, like, it's all about hustling and grinding and all that. So it's like, I had to even check myself or some of that. Like, yo, like, what does that really mean? Um, and it, I don't, again, I don't think Jay-Z's, like wakes up every day, like I'm trying to be um, anti-political and teach black people to not organize. I don't think that's, I'm not saying yeah, right. that, but yeah. that's the effect that a lot of this stuff has. I don't need anyone other than, you know, my, my, maybe my close knit circle and stuff like that. My boys, my people like, yeah, there's a collective sense in that, but I don't need anyone else. And like you said, that's not, like the the ruling class knows that's not even how the world works. Right. <laughs> so, right. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it's it's obvious in their actions that, that they know it's not just about you know personal responsibility or whatever. You wouldn't spend that much money to stop certain laws. You wouldn't throw parties so you could buy these people's influence. Exactly. You do those things if you thought it was just like. They are the most collective, you know, group. I don't like this whole like, you know, socialism for the rich thing. I don't think that's accurate, but but there is a, a cadre of people that know we got to stick together. Like, so even when you talked about Trump, I wrote this piece. I don't know if it's gonna get published because I probably sounded crazy in it, but like I was saying, you know, the white the white ruling class is like, yeah, man, you you broke the collective spirit, bro. Like, <laughs> like you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Like, you went so far. Like, they're treating him like unions treat scabs. <laughs> and for as far as I can tell, the same reason, right? Like, Trump had no class solidarity. He None. fucked with everybody's money. Yep. And so they all collectively were like, no, you can't, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I think what you just said about representation, um, if you haven't written that, uh, you should, because I think that's right. And I think that's different from what most people, even on the left, are saying about it. Mm -hmm. um, and but but yeah, it's it's not even like what representation usually means in a political context is like your interests or our interests through this person. Right. And like Barack Obama specifically <laughs> invalidated that perspective. Yeah. Like specifically addressed it and said, oh, by the way, I'm not doing that. No. Nah. And, every and, and everyone's on board. And, you know, all these other politicians are saying the same thing and are certainly acting like it. Right. And that's, you know, I don't know if it's a different kind of representation, but, you know, or, or, or we should just have a different word for it, whatever, but it's a different thing. And yeah, we have it, to start thinking it as a different thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not the, it's it's I'm just, like I, I like Russell connectors like we were, we've talked about this before him and I were talking. I was like at least the old school black civil rights they give you like a little poverty program or something, you know, like it's just like it wasn't gonna really work, but you know that's what old poverty pimp that's where it came from. Like right. you got so you could get you could get a little you could work you know like. But now it's like you don't even get that. Like you just you just get to feel again. I just get to be like, man, I got a black president, and that's literally like it. You know, <laughs> like I just right. I gotta I like Jay Z's a billionaire, and I don't know what that has to do with me, right? But like I could just be like, man, Ho's a billionaire, or, or Kanye, or who, whoever. Like man, they made it. Like you know, and uh, even with athletes, like man, Bron got five rings now. Like you know, what I'm saying, and and again, these are people I like, like personally. But I'm just saying, like. That's not even really represent. I don't. I mean, if it is representation, it, like you said, it is its own. It's a whole nother paradigm of it. It's not the way we've right. kind of come to understand it, because usually the people are saying the representation is inadequate, right? Like that's kind of the normal critique. Like it doesn't. It doesn't extend down. But I'm like, they're not even really trying to do that anymore. <laughs> so right. Right. I think that's really onto something. And that's and that's and it's it's not that it never happened before, but I think the fact that it's the norm is new in like recent decades. But that that branding thing, I just see that heavy, and I see I guess that's why I brought you on because and I wanted to talk to you because I just see how that really like it it does tri that does trickle down right like the power of black the the, the power that's supposed to come with it doesn't trickle down. But right. the the ideological framing of things, um, right. whether it's due right. to whether it's due to the incentive structures or what people genuinely believe or both, that that trickles down very neatly, you know, that yeah. that 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 is clean as is day. Like um, again, regardless of why, that's why I like that the way you frame it. Regardless of why we're doing it, because I've been again, I've probably been more that once upon a time, and I never really thought it was the best way, you know, in, in, in an ideal sense, but I was like, well, these organizations suck or I can't get along with these people or whatever. So I'm going to just be, right. I'm going to just travel as a poet or something. Right. You know? right. And, 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 and I can, maybe I can build some influence doing that, you know? Um, and I don't, I never thought of myself as some type of, um, you know, influencer or anything like that but i just thought that i just didn't really know any other way to get things done and now i'm more like i think you have to kind of make yourself work with people even if i don't like them all, all the time you know right so yeah man thanks for being on here um where can people find your work um i know we're gonna link all your all the pieces we've referenced as well as the one I didn't get to, but the walk washing and the limits of re representation. Um, but yeah, where, where can we find your work? Um, you know, where can people get in contact with you? Uh, things of that nature. Um, so there's 
so my like professional whatever website is olufemiotaiwo.com it's mainly just like academic articles um but the 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 better site is why everything costs money.com that's where i put summaries of um right now a full summary of capital volume one of eric williams's capitalism and slavery i'm finishing up ruthie gilmore's golden gulag um so hopefully some useful summaries of stuff on that site um and then folks can email me at olufemi.taiwo at georgetown.edu and you got a you're working on a book too right is that did i read that correctly yeah how's yeah that, how's that coming along uh it's about done so they just gotta do the whatever the sending it to press and all that okay all right all right man appreciate it all right for sure yep. see ya yep. Okay. Fresh out the plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. Seem like my homies were stuck.